Welcome to our lecture online. Most of us that have taken a course in astronomy may remember the redshift, the redshift caused by galaxies and stars moving away from us. And we can actually calculate the velocity at which they move away from us by measuring the redshift. It's called the recessional redshift. And of course, since most galaxies in the universe are moving away from us, most galaxies show that redshift. And the faster they're moving, the larger the redshift. But could there be a redshift due to the gravitational potential energy loss when light leaves an object like a planet, a star? Perhaps. Einstein predicted that because of the general theory of relativity. And it turns out he was absolutely correct. Light, as it leaves an object like the Earth or the Sun or any other object that emits light, light will lose energy because it has to overcome the gravitational well that the object creates within space. So the curvature space becomes like a gravitational well where things fall into. And so when things try to leave that gravitational well, they require energy. For example, in order to get a rocket off the Earth's surface and get it up into space, it has to reach the escape velocity of 11 kilometers per second, which is about 7 miles per second, or 25,000 miles per hour. And so light doesn't slow down as it tries to get away, but it still loses energy by overcoming that gravitational potential well. And so the way it does that is by giving up some of its wavelength or some of its frequency perhaps because the energy of a photon, the energy of light, is directly proportional to the frequency of its oscillation. So as light tries to get away from the Earth, it starts to oscillate slower and that's what we know as the gravitational redshift. And we have we have actually done experiments and measured that shift, so there's no question that we can measure that it exists. So here, let's take a look. Here's an example where a galaxy moves away from us, so the light that then is emitted in the opposite direction will be stretched. The wavelength will be longer, the frequency will be slower, and that's called the recessional redshift, and we're familiar with that. But just as light leaves the Earth, it goes through a similar process, not because the Earth is moving away, but because there's a gravitational well and the light loses energy, so the wavelengths become longer as the light tries to leave the Earth, because after all, it has to kind of like overcome that escape velocity in a way, but it's not really the same thing, but it does lose energy. We can actually calculate the shift of the frequency and it turns out, since the Earth is a relatively small object as it comes to the universe, the shift isn't that great. So we can actually calculate the change in the frequency divided by the original frequency of the light that's emitted. So if we think of this as being emitted at f sub naught, then by the time it gets up here, the frequency will be f minus some delta f. So the original frequency minus some shift. It'll be at a lower frequency. And so the wavelengths will be longer. We can calculate that ratio. Here's the equation. is the universal gravitational constant g, the mass of the Earth, the speed of light squared, and the radius of the Earth. When we plug all those numbers in, we get a very, very small shift. It's small, but we can still measure it. Now, if we go to the Sun, the Sun being a much larger object, much more mass, we plug in the mass of the Sun, we plug in the radius of the Sun, and now we get a number that is actually much bigger than it was before, but still a relatively small number. So yes, the light coming from the sun is shifted because of gravitational forces and the light having to overcome that potential gravitational well. But again, from a typical star like the sun, it's not that big. But what about a neutron star that, let's say, contains twice the mass of the sun? Well, twice the mass of the sun would double this number, but now the radius of a neutron star is much smaller. It's only about 10,000 meters rather than 696 million meters of the radius of the sun. And so when you plug that in, notice we have a tremendous shift of almost 30%. What that means is, if for example, here we, instead of using frequency, I like to use wavelength. So we can see that if we add this shift to the original wavelength, which is one times the original wavelength, we get 1.29. So almost 1.3 times the wavelength. The wavelength will be stretched by almost 30%. And for the H alpha line, that very familiar red light from hydrogen, from the hydrogen atom, which after all is the most common element in the universe, being at 656.3 nanometers, it would be stretched to 850.8 nanometers. So it would be stretched from the visible light into the invisible infrared light. We couldn't even see it anymore. So the H alpha line 
if it's emitted from a neutron star, it would be shifted so much that it's no longer visible light, it now would be infrared light. So there, it's quite dramatic for something like black holes, neutron stars. The gravitational redshift is absolutely amazing, and it causes enormous shifts in the wavelengths of the light that try to emanate from those objects. So, true enough, gravitational redshift is another proof of the general theory of relativity. <laughs> Why did I use black for the light emanating? Well, and then you change it to red. And then it went to red. Well, red gives you kind of the redshift concept. So that, that's what it does. It shifts towards the red. It doesn't become red because it's a very small shift. But it gives you the idea of red. I also made the wavelength longer. Since I didn't want to use white, white light would be kind of the light with everything. And then you see it shift to the red. But, so I used black because white wouldn't show very well on the, on the whiteboard. <laughs> so what would be the, the wavelength or the ratio of, uh, of, the, um, of the black hole that you talked about previous? Yes. What would it be like if it was a black hole? Well, it turns out that if you're inside a black hole, let's say here's the singularity of a black hole, and then we have the event horizon, and let's say there's a light source right in here. And light tries to get away from here. It wouldn't get to the event horizon. In other words, all the energy would be drained out of the light and you would have no more oscillating light. In other words, there's just simply not enough energy within each photon to make it outside the event horizon. And that's why light cannot escape from a black hole. So you won't have it. Nothing will come out. You sit there on the other side looking and nothing will come out can't happen too much it requires more energy it's kind of like let's say you want to take this and you want to throw it into orbit you could do that if you make it go fast enough well photons would be able to make it out if they had enough energy they just simply don't have enough energy to make it out good question so let's say something that could actually travel faster than the speed of light <laughs> if we had something that could travel faster than the speed of light then there would be another event horizon <laughs> where if you can't travel faster than that you would make it out yeah, but what if that, one was, uh... that one would make it out that's right if you had something that could travel faster than the speed of light your event horizon would then shrink so to speak the real event horizon but since we know that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light <laughs> the event horizon still stands I'm thinking like a mathematician <laughs> yeah but physicists have to deal with reality yeah. mathematicians got those imaginary numbers Hey, <laughs> for you guys.